Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Fellowship Church. We, uh, we get to start the year of our Lord, the year of our Lord 2023, with some worship. So uh, if you would join us by standing with us, and we're, uh, again, we're focusing on uh, lifting up your voices to fill the room. So uh, let's just turn to the Lord and acknowledge his lordship over everything. As we've been celebrating Christmas, that God in the flesh that Jesus, the King of Kings, has come here into this world to dwell with us. Uh, this world belongs to him rightfully. Uh, everything belongs to him rightfully. He is before all things. Uh, so let's lift him up with our voices and crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many the voices crown him the lord of love behold his hands and side rich wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified no angel in the sky beautiful sound of voices giving praise to Christ. Uh, let's take a minute and encourage the people around you. Welcome them here before we continue our service. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, let me use this opportunity to say Happy New Year. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Church, and I do want to just welcome you all to our service this morning to start the new year, 2023. If you are a guest with us this morning, please make sure you stop and see Anita at Guest Services. She is there to help you with anything that you need this morning, to answer any questions that you have about our church 
and she has a gift for you. So again, we thank you for joining us here this morning as a guest, and we hope that you feel welcome by being here. We are very excited for all that God's going to be doing in our church this year, and many of our regular ministries are starting again soon. So be sure to check our website to get uh, updates on when they will begin. We have uh, men's study beginning soon. We have women's studies that will be happening, uh, TNT, and a lot of other ministries. So make sure you're staying up to date. Check fellowshipefc.org for the schedules as they become available. One ministry that is starting soon is our Fellowship 411 classes. This is a series of four classes that are designed to help you get connected, to learn more about what we believe as a church and why, and discover your purpose here at Fellowship Church. So if you have not yet taken that step towards uh, membership at Fellowship Church, Fellowship 411 is a great way that you can do that. You can see the slide right there. Uh, you can just scan the code or there's a table in the community room where you can sign up. A new year is a great opportunity for you to commit towards taking that step uh, towards membership. So if you are not yet a member of the church, uh, we do want to encourage you to be, uh, become part of what God is doing here officially as a member. So Fellowship 411 will prepare you for that. And there are a lot of other things that will be happening this year that we're excited about. We have a men's conference coming up. We have a missions conference. We have men of prayer starting again, jam, and a number of other things that will be going on. And we want you to be informed about that. So we have an email that you can subscribe to. You'll see the slide there. Subscribe to email updates to learn more about opportunities that we have here for you to worship, grow, and serve. We want each one of you to be a part of the vision of worshiping, growing, and serving with us. So subscribe to the email. It goes out every Friday. It's our weekly bulletin. It gives you all of the information of what's going on in our church, different opportunities for you to worship, grow, and serve. And we are a church that seeks to worship, grow, and serve so that we can fulfill our mission to make disciples who glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's continue to do that now as we behold our King. What a glorious Savior we have, and we've spent a lot of time over the last month or so really just considering who he is. Um, and one thing that we can, we can definitively say is that he is worthy of worship. In Colossians 1, verses 15 to 17, it says this. It says that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So at the same time, this God of gods, King of kings, the second person of the triune God, at the same time, he's the firstborn of creation because he took on human flesh. And this world belongs to him rightfully. Let's take that awe and reverence and wonder and lay it all at his feet as we worship him together. Would you join us? Let's stand together and lift these songs to him. Be in awe and reverence of the one true God who is God in the flesh, fully God and fully man, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge you as the one creator. All things were made by you and for you. And still, Lord, you came to this earth to redeem what was lost. He who was before there was light walked across the pages of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us behold Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the
voice to him. voice represents a life that Lord we want you to reign and rule over because everything that you rule and reign over Lord is glad and blessed because of how good you are and how true you are and how trustworthy you are we yield ourselves to you that more than our voices are going to you in praise Lord our lives even as we look ahead at the, we embark in a new year Lord our lives belong to you be glorified, Lord. Rule and reign over us. Start in our hearts and rule and reign over everything, we ask.
Hallelujah to you, Lord Jesus. Just like God promised, he promised that God's saves would be sent, that Jesus, the salvation of the Lord would be sent. And here we are, each one of us, Lord, evidence of your promise being kept. Each one of our lives, not evidence of perfection, but evidence of redemption that comes from your hand that you take what's broken and you make it whole. You take what's, what's sinful and you make it forgiven. You take what's dead and you make it alive. This is who you are. Even in the, the vision that John, you gave John in the book of Revelation as he stood in the presence of the heavenly realms and he wept there because there was no one found worthy to open the scrolls, to advance things to their, to their uh, the rightful end. But then you reveal the Lamb of God, Jesus. He is worthy. He alone is worthy. Lord, we worship you together today, knowing that all of the heavenly realms worship you too. And it's only right for us, as your redeemed creation, to lift up your name, because there is no one like you. There is no savior like you are. Let's encourage each other with the words of this song. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. And do you feel the shadows deepen? Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? Is. is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Who conquered the grave? He's the 
ransom the slain? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of a blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He Does the Father truly love us? He does. And does the Spirit dwell within us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Amen. He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe. He has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? together he is he is is he worthy is he worthy he is and joy to The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, from every nation and town, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of a blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Is he worthy? Holy Lord Jesus, there is none like you, only you, King of kings, Lord of lords. And we look forward to your return because you have promised you would. Lord, we trust in you. I pray that today you would continue to build up your church, strengthen our faith in you, 
strengthen, Lord, our, 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 uh, the whole parts of the body of Christ. Let each and every part be strengthened to love one another and to serve you with the strength that the Spirit provides. Lord, we thank you for uh, this time together. May your name be glorified in everything we do and say all the time, because that's only right. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time we will uh, dismiss the kids uh, to Kids Church. At this time, our ushers will be making their way forward to distribute our fellowship pads. As you receive those, if you could just sign in this morning. This allows us as pastors to know who God has brought here with us. And we do review uh, who's here each week so that we know how to be praying for you and how to best minister to you. Uh, so again, please just sign in. And if you're a first-time guest, you can indicate that. If you want to subscribe to our emails, you can also indicate that on there. And then when you are all the way through the row, you can just tuck it in the pocket at the end of your row. As a church, our mission is something that we are very intentional about, to uh, make disciples who glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in every phase of their lives. And that is not something that just begins and ends with the pastors or ministry leaders. It is something that we as a church, corporately, as a body, participate in. And there are a number of ways that you can worship, grow, and serve with us to help us accomplish that mission. One of the ways that you can do that is by worshiping through giving. There are a number of ways that you can give to the mission of Fellowship Church. And each one of us has been blessed by God with resources. The amounts may vary, but each one of us has received something from the Father, our provider, that he calls us to give back to him sacrificially as an act of worship. So just be considering and praying about how God is directing you to give this year to the mission of the church to help us accomplish what it is that he's calling us to do to make disciples. And again, there are a number of ways that you can give that you see listed on the screen. And at this time, I want to just take a moment and pray for the mission of the church. Please join me. Father, we thank you that you have, uh, you have called us to be the body of Christ, that your son came to this earth to die, to rise again, and to give us a new life that we can walk in. And everything that we have is because of you. You are our provider. You are our refuge. And we thank you for the different ways that you have provided for us. And we ask that you take our resources as we combine them and give them back to you, to use them to fulfill your purposes here in this world, to fulfill your purposes here for this church in the back mountain, the Wyoming Valley, and the world. You have called us to make disciples who make disciples and who glorify your son, Jesus Christ, in every phase of our lives. So I pray that we would do that through giving, through serving, and through all the ways that you have called us to grow under the ministries here. And again, we thank you for all that you provided. Use these resources for your glory. Amen. morning, everybody. My name is Ben McEntee. I'm one of the lay elders here at Fellowship. Um, I'll be giving the scripture reading this morning. <clears throat> Today we'll be reading Psalm 25. <clears throat> of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. 
for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Can we sing together this song about what we want our lives to be about? Let's stand together. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen.
worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Lord, I'll worship your holy name. be so. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, good morning, Fellowship Church. Um, my name is Nick. I'm the pastor of Student Ministries. And let me be, uh, again, one of those up here to say Happy New Year uh, to you all. Uh, I honestly couldn't think of a better way to start off the new year than my joining together for corporate worship of our great and awesome God. And so when I saw that Christmas Day um, was on a Sunday and New Year's was on a Sunday, I'm thinking, man, this is going to be awesome. I mean, what, what better way to start off a new year than to sing praise and honor and glory to God and just to hear all the voices was just really, really special. Well, as we enter a new year... My guess is that a lot of you are going in with a lot of different emotions. Uh, maybe some of you are excited, you have anticipation, you have maybe endless possibilities. Maybe some of you look ahead to 2023 and you see struggle, hardship, uncertainty. And maybe you woke up this morning and you just see fog and you're feeling a little uncertain about maybe what this year is going to look like. Well, regardless of where you're at right now, God's desire for us is that we trust him. God's desire for us is that we trust him. And I'm sure many would agree with that. Many of us conceptually know we need to trust God. Maybe we know that we can trust God. But sometimes it actually can feel difficult to actually trust him, right? We know we need to trust God. We know that he can be trusted. But then when it comes to actually trusting God, why can it be so difficult? It can be as if trusting God is this abstract concept. And it's because of that that we can often struggle with trusting God through our hardships. Well, my hope this morning is that through God's word, we can deepen our understanding of trusting God and maybe help bring some clarity to what it practically looks like in our lives. And so if you would, I'd invite you to turn to Psalm 25. Um, again, we uh, heard that earlier, and that's what we're going to be in this morning. And so as you turn there, uh, let me just provide a little bit of context here for us. Uh, so Psalm 25 is a psalm of David. And this psalm and this prayer is one of lament, meaning that David is struggling and coping with his present circumstances and his adversaries. And we don't know where exactly this prayer fits into his life chronologically. We're not even sure, as David wrote this, if he's king yet or not. We're not even sure what specific trials he's referring to or what enemies he's referring to. But all that we do know is that David is asking God for help. He's crying out to God. And so we're going to see how David prays and what it says about how we should trust God in the midst of trial. And I love what Charles Spurgeon says about this chapter. Specifically, he says, we see the heart behind the man after God's own heart. And so let that set the stage for us as we enter in. And I just want to preface, there's a lot that we could cover in this passage, but this morning I want to specifically focus on this area of trusting God. So as we work through this, I'm going to be highlighting a few key words and phrases. And so just a heads up, I'm not going to be able to hit everything um, in this passage. And I would definitely encourage you um, this week uh, with our friends or family to spend more time in this psalm during this week because there is just so much in this. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to kind of break down this passage into six sections that will help provide some framework. So if you're a note taker, I'm going to give you some headings. So here we go. Let me just quickly give you an overview here. 
So I have six sections here. And so we're going to first look at the expression of trust, verses 1 through 3, a desire for guidance, desire for forgiveness, praise for God's goodness and mercy, confidence in God's friendship, and then prayer for forgiveness and protection. And so let's work through this here. And the first section is verses 1 through 3. We see an expression of trust. And let me just read this again for us so we have some fresh memory. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. So David starts off his prayer by saying, To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. And so the first question I asked when I read this is, what does that phrase mean? Well, to lift my soul is an idiom for I direct my desire. And an idiom is a phrase or expression that isn't meant to be taken literally. So it's figurative language. Maybe you've heard of it's raining cats and dogs or I have butterflies in my stomach. And I remember as a kid hearing that, I'm like, what? So this is figurative language here. And so David is speaking of surrender and submission to God. It was as if David held his soul in outstretched hands saying, here I am, Lord, completely surrendered to you. And so right away, we see David's heart, a heart of trust. He starts off by saying, God, here I am. Here I am. And in just a few words, we see the heart behind what it looks like to trust Surrender and submission. And what I mean by that, surrender meaning to acknowledge that God is good, he is in control, and his ways are best, and submit to willingly think, feel, and act like you've surrendered to God. So there's this posture of surrender, acknowledging that God is good, that he's in control, and then submission, actually living and doing like you believe that you've surrendered to him. So to surrender and submit. But who is David surrendering and submitting to? Well, verse 2, he says, Oh my God, in you I trust. And you know, trust is one of those words that can often be so hard to define. It's one that we use a lot, but often, what does that even mean? And I often wonder if the root behind struggling to trust God is that we don't actually know what trust means or what it looks like. I mean, how often do we say, I trust God, I'm going to trust God, but deep down we're like, I don't really know what that means. I hope I figure it out along the way. Well, the word trust here specifically means to have confidence in, to be secure, to feel safe. And so right away, David declares who he has placed his confidence in, God. Not David's plans, not David's desires, not the newest self-help book that David found at the nearest bookstore. David says, oh my Lord, in you I trust. David says, to you, in you. And we see such confident language. There's no apprehension or hesitation that we see on behalf of David. As David experiences trial, he boldly approaches God through prayer. David is confident and bold. And likewise, we should approach God confidently through prayer. We're called to be confident as followers of Jesus. And trust and confidence go hand in hand. And so how do we know that David is confident? Again, we see confident language on behalf of David. He says, to you, in you. He says, Lord, meaning Yahweh, the existing one. He says, my God. And so what's amazing is that as David starts off this psalm, the perspective that he has is mind-blowing. Because right away, he's placing the focus on God and not himself. How often when we struggle to trust God in the midst of trial, do we focus so much on ourselves? When we struggle to trust God as we face trial and hardship, it's so easy for us to focus on our Selves. What do we try to do? How can we change our circumstances? But trusting God 
is more about changing our perspective than changing our circumstances. Because David is expressing his need to change, not God. David doesn't say, God, what's going on here? David says, I am the one that needs to change. The goal of David's lament is not to focus, the goal of David's lament is to focus on God, not himself. David's focus as he writes this is to focus on God, not himself. Do you see why this is so important for us to understand? Right away, David puts the focus on God, and he's saying, God, I need to adjust. Because trusting God requires us to change, not God. David doesn't start off with saying, hey, God, David here, I thought we agreed to a plan. Can you please get on board with the plan? God, this is not what I agreed to. What gives? Right. How often do we include these types of phrases in our prayers? But learning to trust God requires us to change, not God. And trusting God requires us to surrender and submit our desires and control over to God. And as we trust God, David reminds us in verse 3 that we are to wait on him. So to be clear, waiting doesn't mean that we're passive. Waiting means that we're active. To wait for God is to set one's hopes in him. This is a disposition of trust and dependence, not passivity. And remember, verse 3 says, None who wait for you shall be put to shame. I mean, how often when we are in the midst of trials do we tell others, well, you know what? I'm just waiting on God. And people might respond, oh, really? Right? Have you ever told somebody, you know what? I'm just, I'm waiting on the Lord. And people go, hmm, hmm, okay. And that can often lead us to feeling embarrassed that our plan is to wait on God. Like when did it become a thing that we can feel embarrassed that our plan is to say, you know what, God, I'm trusting in you and I'm waiting on you. But our culture is so focused on self-help, so much so that when we admit that we're trusting God, it can seem foolish, right? Because what do we do? Well, I can do this. I can figure it out. I don't need help. Well, ironically, the self-help industry profited an estimated $13 billion this last year, which tells me that a lot of people are looking to themselves to figure out their problems which biblically speaking won't work out in the end. It will leave us feeling, as David says in verse 3, ashamed. And so to be put to shame here, what that means is that you have relied on a false basis of hope. So if you are placing your hope in something that's not God, then spoiler alert, you will be put to shame. Because that plan will ultimately fail you. But those who wait on the Lord, our hope is in a trustworthy basis. And you see, waiting here doesn't mean that we're helpless or lazy. Waiting means that we're actively trusting God and setting our hope on him. Not ourselves or worldly things that will leave us empty. And so this this first section here was pivotal to understand because it sets up the framework for the rest of this psalm. So let's continue on. Verses 4 and 5, we see a desire for guidance. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And so we see this mood change from expressing trust to submission to God. And as David laments, he prays, make me to know your ways. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach me. Right? Notice the humility that David exemplifies here. He's asking God to make him know God's ways. And so humility is key when it comes to trusting God. Because in order to trust God, you need to humbly surrender and submit your desires to God. Why? Because trust requires us to be teachable and trust requires humility. Because here's the reality. Humility doesn't show weakness. Humility shows strength. 
Humility doesn't show weakness, it shows strength. And our world wants to paint humility as a bad thing, but biblically speaking, humility is a good thing, especially when it comes to giving honor and praise to God, because humility shows confidence in our great and amazing God. Behold him. And we see that David's knowledge and understanding of God only fuels his humility, because look at how he addresses God. O oh Lord, meaning Yahweh. And then he says in verse 5, for you are the God of my salvation. And so David was recalling to mind who God is, and his response was humility and patience, so much so that he would wait all the day long. And again, waiting isn't passive. Waiting takes work. And part of that work is continuing to reflect on what David says in verse 4, to make me know your ways. And if you want to know what God's ways are, open the Bible. If you've ever asked the question, what does God desire for my life? Go to the Bible. If you've ever wondered, I wonder what God would say about this, go to the Bible. If you've ever wondered, could I know God? Go to the Bible. I hope you see my point here. I could keep going. If you desire to trust God more deeply, you must spend time in God's word and know how it applies to your circumstances. Number three, we see a desire for forgiveness. Verse six says, remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. Remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. And so right away, we notice this word remember appear three times in two verses. And so here's a Bible study tip, free of charge, my gift to you to say Happy New Year. If you see a word repeated multiple times in a short section, that means it's really important. I, don't, I won't give you a receipt for that. Right away, you should notice that this word remember appears multiple times. And what that word means here is to call to mind, be reminded of, attend to, focus on. And so when David is asking God to remember, he's not implying that God has forgotten, but rather David is calling attention to. He's adjusting the zoom here. He's calling attention to. So for God to remember something is for him to attend to it in order to act. And David is asking God to attend to, to respond to him in mercy rather than according to his sins. And so what does David want God to focus on? God's own mercy and steadfast love, which also translates loving kindness, which is what Pastor Mark talked about a few weeks ago. And what does David want God to not focus on? The sins of his youth. And again, we don't know what point this psalm was written. It could be earlier in his life, later in his life. We don't entirely know. But regardless of how old he is, David is still torn by his sins, even sins that he committed years ago. David is wretched by the sins that he's committed. And friends, let me remind you, I want to be explicit here. Time does not forgive sin. Time doesn't purchase the forgiveness of God. It's only through Jesus that we can find true forgiveness. Amen. Ephesians 1, 9 says, In him, referring to Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Friends, our sins are dealt with there at the cross. They don't fade away after time. Our sin is not one of those things that if we just ignore for a while, they'll go away like that closet in your house that needs attention. But how often do we ignore sin with the hope that it would just go away, that God will just kind of forget about it? And if you have sin in your life that you're hoping will fade away with time, that sin won't in the eyes of God. You must go to the cross. And that's why we spent a whole semester talking about sin this past fall. And so you might be thinking, well, what does forgiveness have to do with any of this? 
Well, I'm glad you thought that. As David reflects on who God is, David more clearly sees who he is. And as David looks at himself compared to God, David's response is none other than repentance. As David reflects on who God is, what is his response? Forgive me, O Lord. His response to God's goodness is repentance. And so friends, if you struggle with pride and you have a desire to pursue humility, let this be an invitation to take time to study God's nature and character. Because as you deepen your understanding of God's grace and his mercy, his goodness, you'll quickly reshape your perspective of yourself. The more you study God's goodness and his love and mercy, you're going to look at yourself a whole lot differently. Because nothing changes my heart and attitude more during the day when I think, hey, I'm doing pretty well. And then I read about what God says about my sin and how he views it. Boy, my heart changes real fast. Our response to God's goodness should be to seek forgiveness. And again, what does forgiveness have to do with trusting God? Well, failure to trust God is sin. Jeremiah 17 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. And then later in James chapter 4, he says, Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. And God's desire is for us to trust him. And when we fail to trust him, we disregard disregard what he's asked us to do, which is sin. And so what do we do when we fail to trust God? What do we do when we sin? We go to the cross. This isn't just a nice image that we have on the wall. This is a reminder of what we need to do. You see why forgiveness is such a huge part of trusting God? When we fail to trust God, we sin. What do we do with sin? We go to the cross. We repent and seek forgiveness. So really, forgiveness and trust go hand in hand. And so up to this point in this passage, David has been crying out to God personally. And then here in verse 8, he now speaks to the people. So let's look at verses 8 through 11. In this next section, praise for God's goodness and mercy. Verse 8 says, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. For those who keep his covenant and his testimonies, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. And again, we see a number of statements here celebrating the character of God. And I want to just highlight two specifically. Verse 8. David says, good and upright is the Lord. Well, both God's nature and his ways are true. And it's because of God's goodness and his uprightness that he instructs sinners. Because God is so good, he instructs sinners. Because God is good and just, He teaches and corrects us. That's why Hebrews 12 says, For the Lord disciplines those he loves. And it's because of God's goodness, his love, and his mercy that he instructs us. God's goodness and his mercy are what leads to him teaching and correcting us. And think about it this way. Would you call a parent loving for allowing their children to repeatedly touch a hot stove? No, you help your kids understand that because the stove is hot, you shouldn't touch it. Why? Because you don't want to see them get hurt. It's because of God's goodness that he corrects us. And we often want to separate God's goodness from his correction, but you can't have one without the other. There are two sides of the same coin. And then verse 9, he says, he leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. I mean, that humility aspect just keeps hanging around, doesn't it? Because God leads the humble to what is right and what we should do. And what is that? His way. 
And you know how many times I've heard students say over the years, you know what, I just want to do what is right. I want to do what is right, but I'm not sure what that way is. Well, here it is. God's way is the right way. Why? Because he's trustworthy. You will not be put to shame. He is truth. He's the God of our salvation. This entire psalm. And how many of his paths are right? Verse 10 says, all the paths. You can't have some of this. It's all or nothing. And then look at what David says in verse 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. And what he's saying here is that it's going to take such a great God to pardon my great iniquities. But I believe that you are that great God. You are rich in love and mercy, so please pardon my guilt. And this posture is what Paul writes about in Romans 5 when he says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abound all the more. God's ways are good, so know and follow them. Number five, confidence in God's friendship, verses 12 through 15. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. And so if you need another reason to trust God, verse 14 here says friendship. Well, what what does friendship mean? Well, John 15, Jesus talks about how he is the true vine and describes more in depth what abiding in Christ looks like. Well, after John 15, that description, look at what Jesus says in verse 15 here on the screen. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. And so when we have placed our faith in Christ, God no longer sees our sin. He sees Jesus. And what's fascinating is this word friendship here actually gives this connotation, this imagery of a groomsman in a wedding. We see deep relationship here. So when he says friendship, imagine a wedding ceremony and you see the bridal party lined up, standing in unison with the bride and groom. The first thing you think of when you see them is, wow, they must have deep friendship and relationship. You don't see the bride and groom saying, okay, we need somebody up here. Anybody? Anybody? (laughs) They pick who they have deep relationship with. There's friendship. There's closeness. And this is the imagery that we see here because in Christ we have friendship with God. And this friendship that David knows he has with God is again what fuels his confidence and trust in God through the midst of trials. Because when we have a relationship with Jesus and we're struggling to trust in God, we remind ourselves that in Christ we have friendship. There's relationship. We're trusting in the God who we have a restored relationship with. And so now David gathers all of these thoughts And he he directs his attention towards his particular troubles here in the last section. Prayer for forgiveness and protection. Verse 16, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. And so how does David start this section? He acknowledges that there's hardship in front of them. He's acknowledging that there's hardship and trial right in front of him. And so keep in mind, as we read this sweet comforting psalm. This psalm was written out of a season of agony on behalf of David. And much of this agony that he's distressing over is coming from his enemies, for he had many. 
He says in verse 19, consider how many are my foes. But what's amazing here is that David, as David agonizes over his enemies, and as he considers his trials, those ultimately don't take the primary focus of his life. Because what is his response to him considering all of his enemies and his trials? What does he say? Forgive all my sins. That's not what I would be saying right there. But as David talks about everything that is going wrong, why in the world would that lead David to ask forgiveness? Because David acknowledged that his greatest problem wasn't his enemies. His greatest problem was his sin. As David considers how many enemies he has, how many afflictions he's facing, his enemies hate him with hatred. And here in the original uh, language here, the original Hebrew, it says with hate, hatred. It uses the same word hate twice. David says, I can't think of a better way to describe how I feel than hate, hate. But that drives him to his sin. It drives him to his sin. It's as if David recognized, I have many enemies and troubles, but none greater than my own sins. So please, dear God, deal with my sins. And then he says, for I take refuge in you. Well, the word refuge here means to flee for protection, to put trust in, to hope in. What a beautiful picture of what it looks like to trust God, to put your hope in, to put your trust in, to flee for protection. And then in verse 22, as he ends, he says, Redeem Israel, O God, out of his troubles. And again, what faith David demonstrates here is that in the midst of trials, he still wasn't solely focused on himself. He's concerned about his people, the nation of Israel. As he's considering his enemies and his trials, he considers his people. And through this whole psalm, David still shows care and concern for the people around him. I mean, how often when we are struggling, do we take time to consider those around us? How often as we endure hardship, do we take time to reflect on others who are also enduring hardship? Well, church, that's why we designed the worship center in this way. So that as we worship God, we can look around and be reminded of everyone who is in trial. We can be reminded of everyone who needs Jesus. We can be reminded as we worship of those who are continuing to trust God. And you see, suffering causes us to want to shift the focus to ourselves. But when that happens, we become isolated. And that's exactly what Satan wants. Because what, do, uh, what does First Peter say? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And what do lions look for? The lonely wildebeest to pick them off from the herd. And so here's what I mean. Maybe you've said, I'm having a rough week. I'm going to skip church this morning. I don't feel like being around people, so I'm not going to join a community group this year. I need to rest after a rough day, so I'm going to skip my Bible and my prayer time. You know what, I just can't serve in a ministry that's in need because I'm just in a bit of a rough patch. But here's what we should desire to say. This week has been one of the worst weeks I've had in a while. I need to get to church. I'm feeling isolated. You know what, how can I rearrange my schedule so I can join a community group because I need community? You know what, I'm feeling so overwhelmed. I need to make more time for my Bible and prayer time. You know what, all I can see and think about right now are my trials. Maybe I should consider how to serve somebody else who's in need this week. Friends, let me encourage you, don't allow suffering to be what isolates you. Let it be what unites you with others. And so I know we've covered a lot and we've not covered everything, but let me begin to wrap up here with just a few points of application and I have six here specifically. Number one, Trusting God doesn't mean life will be easy. 
This is an amazing psalm with such great truth, but don't gloss over the pain that David writes this in. He says, I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Consider my affliction and trouble. Consider how many are my foes. With what violent hatred they hate me. David is struggling and facing hardship, yet he continues to trust in God. And so remember that trusting God will put us in hard, not so ideal circumstances, but hardship doesn't excuse us from trusting in God. So trusting God is not going to be easy, but God is there with us. Number two, there's no shame in asking God for help. And it may seem silly to hear a pastor say that, but I want to be sure you hear it. There's no shame in asking God for help. Because we see this word shame appear multiple times, and shame doesn't mean embarrassed or awkward. It means being let down or disappointed, having trusted in something that in the end proved unworthy. Because Psalm 25, it's not a prayer of, please don't let me be embarrassed by my hardships. It's God, my faith is in you. Would you please deliver and guide me? And so remember, confidence doesn't always mean clarity. You can be confident in God and still have no idea what's going on. But trusting is knowing who knows what's going on and who has control over it. Number three, trust involves waiting. And maybe some of you were thinking, man, I wish you would just go past that one. And when we think of waiting, we may think of waiting as in the doctor's office, waiting in line at the grocery store, waiting in line at the DMV. Ugh. Sorry, I don't want to go. But waiting on God is not like that. It's not that type of waiting that maybe you're thinking of. Waiting on God is like a server in a restaurant. If I'm a server, I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to give you my attention and my focus. So as we wait on God, don't stand around, arms folded, tapping the floor, waiting for something to happen. No, God says, get moving. And so as we wait, God doesn't ignore us, but he continues to show grace. And number four, trust means you surrender and submit. And again, what I mean by that here, surrender meaning to acknowledge that God is good, he is in control, his ways are best, and then to submit, think, feel, and act like you believe that. And so when you struggle to trust God, I would encourage you as a simple reminder, surrender and submit, surrender and submit. And if you're looking for a practical plan to trust God, Continually ask yourself this question, in what ways can I surrender and submit to God today? If you don't know how to trust in God in this moment, ask that question, in what ways can I surrender and submit to him today? Number five, trust requires humility and repentance. David doesn't write this psalm by saying, hey, I'm the guy who defeated Goliath. Remember me? But the language he uses demonstrates a deep understanding of God, and that produces humility. And so those who struggle with pride need to deepen their understanding of who God is, because the more you understand who God is, the more humble it makes you. Because the key to humility is not despising yourself, but rather focusing on God, his character and his goodness. And as you do so, humility becomes very natural. And then lastly, number six, to trust God is to focus our perspective on him, not our circumstances. David writes, to you, O Lord, make me know your ways, for you are God, for your name's sake. If you want a fun study, go back through this and look at the tone in which he writes this. It's very much towards God. Because as David struggles, his focus is clearly on God, not himself. And so trust doesn't get rid of hardship, but it takes away the power and control over your life. Trust doesn't just get rid of hardship, but it takes away the control that it has in your life. And so as we look ahead to a new year, some of you may be excited. You might see possibilities. 
Maybe you're experiencing anticipation. Maybe others of you see pain, struggle, trial. And maybe some of you have no idea what's ahead. Let me encourage you that no matter what you see, trusting God is one of the best things you can do to start off this year. And I'm not suggesting this as a New Year's resolution. I'm urging you to make it a lifestyle. I'm not suggesting, you know what, I'm going to trust God more this year. That's my New Year's resolution. Maybe it's something I'm going to do for a while, and in two weeks I'm going to find something else. I'm urging you to make trusting God a lifestyle. Because what better way to respond to what we just celebrated at Christmas? And so friends, are you going to focus your eyes and attention on your struggles? Or will you focus your eyes, as verse 15 says, toward the Lord? In his book, Trusting God, Jerry Bridges writes, God's plan and his ways of working out his plan are frequently beyond our ability to fathom and understand. We must learn to trust when we don't understand We must learn to trust. If you keep hoping that you'll just figure out this trusting God thing at some point, it's probably not going to work out too well. And I don't want to see you go down that road. I want to see you on the road towards surrendering and submitting your lives to Jesus through whatever hardship and struggle you're facing. And let me leave you with the words of Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. If you're asking yourself the question, I need some help. What do I do? Where do I go? Friends, verse 2 says it clearly. My help comes from the Lord. So as you begin this new year, where are you going to run to? My hope and prayer is that you run to Jesus. Because God is worthy of our trust. Will you trust him? God is worthy of our trust. Will you trust him? Let's pray and respond to these truths in worship. Lord Jesus, I can think of so many times where I fail to trust you. And I'm sorry for that. God, I pray that my faith would be more deeply enriched in the truth of who you are and your goodness and your nature. God, I pray that for those in the room who are struggling to trust in you, which my guess is probably all of us, God, I pray that we would look to you. May our eyes not be focused on our circumstances. May our eyes be focused on the cross knowing that no matter what we face in this lifetime, when we are in relationship with Jesus, we know that one day there will be no pain, there will be no more tears, there will be no more struggles. So God, I pray that we would actively wait on you to actively trust in you. And as we do so, may we not be put to shame. May we be confident and bold in our ability to trust in you, knowing that our hope when it's placed in you will always be the best decision that we will ever make. God, I pray that as we sing together, as we hear each and every voice cry out, that we would be reminded of our need for grace, our need for forgiveness, and that we can worship as a body of Christ here declaring your worth and the goodness of who you are. God, thank you for this time and for the opening of your word. May it change and transform our lives. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. No one who puts their trust in the Lord will ever be put to shame. No one who trusts in God truly will ever regret it because he will always live up to what we rely on. His faithfulness is perfect, and he gets glorified in the end. So we have a a song that uh, we haven't sung here very often, but I know you know the tune, and we're going to reclaim this this, uh, tune and use it to, uh, to glorify Christ, that this entire year that our lives can be about putting our trust in him, 
pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, in our lives as it is in heaven. This is what he's setting out to do. Let's trust in him wholeheartedly and let him be glorified as a result. Let's all stand together. Should nothing of our efforts and no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain its builders strive to you who boast to lift our voices. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. Amen. I have told you all these things so that in me you may have peace. Here on this world, you will face trials and sorrows, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And if you believe that, then as you leave here today, whether it's through what you say, what you do, what thoughts enter your mind, may they be reflected through all glory be to Christ. Will you surrender and submit to Jesus today, tomorrow, and every day that the Lord gives us here on this mist that we have. Let's pray. God, thank you for the day. I pray that as we leave this place, that what we heard today would not stay here. I pray that it would go before us, that it would go with us. 
and that your namesake, Lord Jesus, would be glorified. Help us to worship you, help us to grow in our relationship with you, and help us to serve you as we actively wait on you. God, as we experience trouble and struggle, may we continually place our hope and confidence in you, knowing that if we do so, we will never be put to shame. Help us to be ambassadors of Christ here as we leave and let let others know that there is hope. Help us to be the beginning of that, the start of that. And we thank you for today. And we ask this in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You are sent.